A reading from the book of Joshua. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? No, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. You may have a seat. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Oh, we are great, and I love it. Hey, before I get to preaching, because uh, you guys know how I like preaching, let me, let me say a couple things uh, for you guys to be aware of. So uh, first, if you have not been to a vision meeting, which is how we're ex- explaining, how we're expanding our building and the plan over the next 18 months, I would love for you to join us right after this, 1230. We will, if you're like, I don't know what I'm doing for lunch, join us for lunch. We'll provide lunch. And so we would love for you to hang out for that. Uh, it's just important for all of us to be on the same page where we're going and how we are getting there. Uh, number two, tomorrow night, please do not miss it. It is a worship and dedication night of this space. We are worshiping together. I want you to bring your kids. The only people we need to register, if you have kids two, two years old and younger, then if you could register and we will have childcare for them, everybody else, your kids, we want them to be a part of it. We're going to worship together. We're going to scatter through this whole building and pray over every space. And then we're going to go into the new space that we're expanding into, and we are going to write names on the floor, scripture on the floor, people we are praying over, children we are praying over. It's going to be a powerful time of consecrating this space unto the Lord, and and we would love for you to come and participate. And then lastly, next Sunday, November 10th, is Pledge Sunday. So if if you don't know what that is, please come to a vision meeting. We want all of our church together pledging, moving forward and how we are building this house, expanding it together. It's going to be an incredible day. We're going to bring our pledges. We're going to collect stones just like the Israelites did as they crossed over the Jordan River to mark out a memorial, and and we we just are thrilled uh, for for joining together in that. So uh, we have been working our way, looking at the Israelites crossing into the Promised Land as Joshua has been leading, and kind of this parallel of the house they were building, why they did it, and the house we're building. And so we've been seeing from these various angles that we are building a house of worship in the Word. We are building a house for, of the presence of God. We are building a house of redemption where we see that anyone, no matter their pain, no matter their past, no matter what they've been through, it, the blood converts sinners into saints. And last week we looked at that we're building a house for future generations of God to have their encounter and their God moments. And today we come to the most important reason. And I don't say that lightly, um, because our m- reasoning, why we gather, why we do church, uh, this is more important than the lost. This is more important than the next generation. This is more important than you and me. This is that we are building a house to the glory of the only one who could ever save. We are building a house to the fame of the name that is above every name. We are building a house for Jesus, you guys. God's people have escaped Egypt. They've wandered in the wilderness. They've crossed over the Jordan River, and then right before they go into this battle, Jesus shows up and manifests himself to Joshua. Here's what it says. It says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And what we take from this, this passage is that Jesus leads his people. They are about to step into the most important battle, the most important moment in their nation's history, and Jesus is there with him. Whenever you're reading the Old Testament, you have to always have this filter, this question, what is this teaching me about Jesus? How is this pointing me forward to Christ? And certain passages are easier than others to see that. Uh, this is as easy as it gets. 
Jesus is actually there. Now, we don't like to think, we don't typically think, we're like, no, no, Jesus shows up in the New Testament. No, he is all throughout the Old. He is there at creation, and there are these moments where these Christophanies, these pre-incarnate Christs, he shows up and he manifests himself to people. And so Joshua has this encounter with Jesus where Jesus actually manifests himself. Now, this word manifest, it's a Greek word. It's the word emphanizo. And it means to make apparent, to let oneself be intimately known and understood. Now, here's what we know about God. He's omnipresent, right? God is here in this space right now. There is nowhere on this earth you can go to hide from the presence of God. But there are these moments where God manifests as in reveals, as in makes himself known to people in a unique way. We see this in the book of Acts constantly when his hand shows up and starts writing on the wall. We see this in Paul's encounter where Jesus reveals himself to Paul, and we see it blatantly here with Joshua. Now, how do we know this is not just some angel, right? Like, oh, it's just some angel with a sword. Uh, I'll tell you how we know. Because there are other times where angels show up And people are freaked out because we think angels are like beautiful, like, oh, they have their wings, right? They look like a supermodel. Like, no, angels are creepy, right? There's like eyeballs everywhere and wings all, and people are terrified and they fall down and they worship them because they're so terrified. And every time, you know what those angels do? They're like, whoa, whoa, bro, get up, okay? I saw what happened to Lucifer. I do not want that to happen to me. Do not worship me, okay? What happens here when this man shows up with a sword and Joseph, Joshua falls down on his face and begins to worship. He says, what would you have me do? We know it's Jesus because he doesn't tell him to get up and stop worshiping. He says, the ground you are standing on is holy. It's Jesus showing up. And it's interesting as you read through the New Testament, these New Testament authors are constantly making comment and marks about these passages, about these encounters. Like Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he's, the apostle Paul says that God's people in the Old Testament, they were led out of Egypt by Jesus. And they were led through the wilderness by Jesus. And he says, the cloud of his presence, you know what that was? He says it was Jesus. The manna, that fell from heaven to sustain them, what was it? It was Jesus. He says even Jesus was the rock in which Moses strikes and water pours out. He's like, that was Christ the whole time. He was with them. Jude writes about it. Jude says, not only does he, is Jesus the one that leads them out of Egypt, Jesus is the one who leads them in conquering over evil and their enemies. See, here's what I need you to understand. Jesus didn't just show up to Joshua as he's preparing for battle. Jesus has been with his people the whole time. He's been there. They just don't always recognize it. And if Jesus was with them in a way they didn't recognize, I know that he's been with you and me in a way that we don't always recognize. But take comfort. Jesus is still leading his people. He is still with you. One of the most painful seasons of my life, just walking through grief was about six years ago when I, when I lost my mom. And I went down to California and I was with my family and then I came up to be with my wife and, and, and kids. And, and we had told our kids like, that their Mima was gone, that we lost her, it was very sudden and heartbreaking. And I'll never forget the mor- morning, I was, I, I was, I'd been home only a couple days and, and my daughter Nova, she was like three years old at the time, didn't understand the depths of what was happening. Didn't understand what it means that Mima is gone and that she's no longer with us. And she comes running into my room, and she's so excited, and she's like, Dad, 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 I saw Mima. And you know, you do what you do as a dad when you're like, your, your kid says something weird, but you still love him. You're like, oh, that's cute, you know? And she like gets upset with me. She goes, no, last night, while I was dreaming, I saw Mima, and she was with Jesus, and she was so happy. And I sat there and I thought, like, why is this so hard in my logical mind to be like, God could reveal himself to a three-year-old if he wants? 
If he can reveal himself through a rock in the Old Testament, if he can reveal himself through manna in the Old Testament, through a pillar of cloud and fire, listen, he can reveal himself to you and I today. Jesus still manifests himself and reveals himself. Here's what we need to understand. Jesus is with us. It's Jesus who is comforting you as you walk through grief. You just don't know how it's going to show up. In the Old Testament, he he showed up and he sent manna. Today, you know what he's doing? He's sending the people of his church. He shows up as a neighbor. He shows up as a friend, a letter, a phone call at just the right moment. It's Jesus making his presence known and his comfort known. It's Jesus who is leading you through your wilderness. In the Old Testament, he sent a pillar of fire. Today, it's sending his guiding scripture. He is Spoken to us. His comfort is with us. It's Jesus who is providing everything you need. In the Old Testament, he poured forth water from a rock. For you today, he's pouring forth blessing from whatever means he chooses. Jesus is still leading his people. And we cannot get this confused because it's Jesus who we need commanding our ship. You know that? It's Jesus who we need leading our church. And if we let anything else hijack our church, take command of our vessel, take lead over our lives, we will get so off track, we don't even know where we are anymore. But look at this conversation. Joshua went up to him and said, are you for us or for our enemies? And what does Jesus say? No, right? Joshua was like, that wasn't an option. <laughs> you know, like left or right. No, right? But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Here's what I need you to understand. Jesus doesn't choose sides, okay? Now, I don't know if you heard rumor, but apparently Tuesday is a big day in our nation. No? Am I the only one? All right? I know you guys slept in an extra hour, but be with me on this, okay? All right? I, there is an election on Tuesday. Some of you guys, and, and I have some things I want to say about it. Some of you guys who are new are like, I am, what, what is happening right now? Those of you guys who have been around for a while are like, I, no, let's go, okay? You, 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 you know where this is going, okay? Um, here's the first thing I want to say. Um, I, I just want to say how important it is that you actually participate. It's incredibly important that you vote. We, we as Christians in our society, we have a significant responsibility to participate in our community, in our country. We can't say we want to see our city saturated with the gospel and then not participate as representation of the kingdom, you guys. We are kingdom citizens. And so when it comes to speaking about who leads both our country and our city as representations, we need to play a role. And I don't know if you realize this, but sometimes local elections are w- affect us way more than national. And as, as members of the kingdom, as representations of Christ, we have a vote and a voice, and we need to participate. Uh, Barna, which is kind of the leading study, Uh, on these areas estimates that 32 million church attending Bible believing Christians won't vote in this election. And I've just gotten a deep conviction that we are called to participate and be a voice in the direction our society is is headed. So don't take this responsibility lightly. We're called to be salt. You know what salt is? We think it adds flavor. Salt in in this day and age, because, you know, for us, we're like, put it on our eggs. Like back then, salt is what stymied corruption. As the church, we're called to be salt, okay? So, So we need to participate. But there's a second thing I need to say in light of this passage. Think about the context of this question. Joshua is representing Israel, the chosen people of God. And he's leading them against the Canaanites, people who have marked themselves as God's enemy. And Joshua walks up to Jesus and he's like, hey, okay, listen, sir, are you for us or are you for our enemies, right? It's an easy question. Are you for the people of God or are you for the enemies of God? And what does Jesus say? He says, no, because Jesus doesn't choose sides. Are you for America Are you for the foreign countries? Are you for the Republicans? Are you for the Democrats? Are you for the Charismatics? Are you for the Reformed? Are you for the sinners? Are you for the saints? Jesus doesn't choose your side, but your side better choose Jesus. He is the side. 
He is how we live. He is how we walk. He is how we breathe and speak and and teach. Jesus is not for your political party, but your politics better be for Christ. Jesus is not on the side of your church, but your church better be for Jesus. Jesus is not with you or your enemy, but you better be for Jesus. And we have to get this right. Otherwise, what happens is the outcomes of elections They will either crush us or they will deceive us into thinking the victory has been won. Church, listen to me. Victory is not when our party wins an election. Victory is when hearts and lives surrender to Christ. That's what we're doing. That's what we're preaching. That's what we're living for. And so later this week, you know what's going to happen? Millions of people are going to be devastated. There may be riot maybe celebrate, maybe cheer, maybe weep tears of rejoicing or tears of crushing collapse. And they're gonna say, this is the end of our country as we know it again, four years and four years and four years, right? (laughs) But there's another group of people, people of a different kingdom. And later this week, they're gonna get up and they're gonna brew their coffee and they're gonna crack open their sacred scriptures. And they're gonna bow their heads in prayer. And they are gonna pray for their children. They're gonna pray for their country. They're gonna pray for their leaders. They're gonna pray for their church. And they're gonna drop their kids off at school. And then they're gonna move forward in being salt of the earth and light of the world, bringing forth the kingdom in one act of love and grace at a time. You hear me? That is the call of the people of God. And why is there such a stark contrast between how these two groups are gonna respond? Let me tell you why. Because on Tuesday, we are electing a politician, but they're crowning a king. You hear me? And do not get those two things confused. And if we, because if we get this backwards, we can no longer stand as a beacon of hope, but just one more worldly noise banging our gong, trying to get people's attention. You don't think I have political opinions? I do, and they're right, all of them, okay? (laughs) But this pulpit is not your political platform. This pulpit exists to preach a pillar of truth in which we can build our lives upon no matter what has happened in the world around us. Uh, Five, six weeks ago, there was a guy who uh, came back. When I'm prepping on Sundays, um, I spend a lot of time in the Word in the morning. I actually spend a lot of time in the Psalms, just preparing my heart and just in prayer uh, to enter into this space because I take this space very seriously. And uh, an individual came back uh, with a pamphlet you know what I'm talking about? A little political pamphlet? Like, oh, I've never heard these things before. Thank you so much for enlightening me. My life has changed. Okay, yeah, one of those. Um, no snarkiness there. And uh, he came back in t- to knock on my, uh, knock on my office door. Uh, and uh, Kristen Friend saw him. And Kristen Friend is so nice. Just don't mess with her family or her church, okay? So she stepped in in this situation, and she's like, hey, this is not the time or the place, okay? Um, this, is, this is not what that moment is for. And so um, they get into a disagreement, and uh, he ends up leaving. And she emails him the next day. And like, I'm not, although I've done it once in this, uh, this series already, I'm not one for reading emails, but like, I ju- you just have to hear this because this is incredible, all right? I've changed any names, so she doesn't actually say brother, but I just changed his name to brother and, and blank. So it, l- let, me, uh, let me read this to you. Dear blank, I wanna follow up on our conversation from yesterday. I want you to know I hear you. You care deeply about this country and feel a calling in your life to be bold and sharing. Brother, I'm with you. I'm not against you. You and I probably align more than you know, but I need to be clear so that you know our expectations. Rise City Church exists to lift the name of Jesus alone. Every other leader on this earth will fail us. They will sin and they will lead astray. We only elevate and exalt Jesus in this church. The sheet that you are desiring to share for us to share and elevate doesn't have wrong information, but it doesn't point to the single truth that we stand upon. Jesus is the only answer to our nation's problems. Giving time and energy to anything less than him is unfruitful and disobedient to God's call on our church. This isn't something we will discuss. 
You're welcome to disagree, but when it comes to our platform, we are unwavering. We are always, only, fully, clearly all about Jesus. No other leader or policy will take time from us sharing Jesus' gospel. The gospel alone heals, restores, brings life, and leads people to the bread of life and everlasting waters. This election will pass, and God will still be lifted high. 2028 will come around, and there will be more division and fighting, but we will press in and stand on Jesus' truth and love people with all the strength and that the Holy Spirit has given us. My prayer through this election, is that people from all backgrounds can walk into our church, experience the Holy Spirit, hear and receive Jesus' grace and truth, and walk out changed forever, just like you and I are. We have been transformed by his grace and now can live and vote in that truth. On Sunday mornings, we prepare, practice, and dwell on the Word of God. We will not give time and space to distractions about voting or politics, but only to shepherding and leading our congregation and guests to a deeper knowledge of, of love of Christ. We, would we be a church on our knees begging God for a revival in Gresham in his love, Kristen Friend? Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Best email ever. <laughs> Jesus is what we need, you guys. Jesus is what we preach. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our king. Jesus is our savior. And if that means nothing to you in the midst of, of a, a political turmoil, then you need to check your allegiance and check your heart and check your hope. Listen, you can come in here and be a Republican. You can be a Democrat. You can be a Calvinist. You can be a charismatic. You can be an American. You can be an immigrant. You can be reformed. You can be a sinner. You can be a saint. I don't care what you are as long as you're not a Laker fan. You are welcome in this place, okay? Who, what, however you identify, when you walk through the doors of this house, leave that identity at the door. Because in this house, all that matters is who we are in Jesus, who he has called us, saved us, formed us, and made us to be. And maybe, just maybe, little by little, we'll stop taking those false identities, and we'll stop picking them up on the way out, and we'll carry out who Jesus has made us to be. And then we can be salt. And then we can be light. And then we can be hope to a hurting world that is confused and broken. We are building a place in the middle of our city that declares Jesus is king, you feel me? Week in and week out. And if Jesus is on the throne, I don't care who's in the White House. We, I will continue to press forward in preaching the gospel. We will continue to press forward in serving our city. So hear me, absolutely participate. Absolutely vote. Absolutely engage. But you better put your first allegiance to the commander of the Lord's army and surrender to him and follow him in the battle. Because if we don't, we're gonna miss it. And if we started to actually understand and submit to, and live in light of Jesus' rule and reign, we would be different people. Look at what happens to Joshua. It says, then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence. Like, Joshua is one of the greatest commanders the world has ever seen. He is leading this this army into battle. He's afraid of nothing. And he sees Jesus and he falls face down to the ground in reverence. And he asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. You guys, what we need more than anything is we need an encounter with Jesus. That's what changes us. That's what emboldens us. That's what gives us resolve and conviction and courage to press forward in being who we are called to be. When people encounter God 
in the scriptures, this is what happens. They fall on their faces. When Isaiah gets a glimpse of the throne room of God's glory and presence, he's like, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. We need an encounter with Christ. When Paul meets Jesus, he falls on his face. When John gets a glimpse of the resurrected Christ, he says he fell to the ground as if dead. If we actually encountered Christ, our lives would be changed forever. That is what we need. Our problem isn't that our theology isn't deep enough or our serving isn't often enough or our prayers aren't honest enough. Our problem is that our awe and longing and desire for Jesus isn't central enough. That he is what we need. An encounter with him. We need Jesus to be the central shining light of our church and our lives. Um, I love living in the Pacific Northwest. And one of my favorite things to do is to walk out in the beauty of night, out in the forest. You ever just get out on like a Mount Hood and then you just look up and you just see the beauty of the stars of this space and this place? Just the awe and the wonder, and it's just magnificent. But an interesting thing happens every morning is the sun starts to rise and those stars fade away. Now, why do those stars fade? Do they like run and hide? Do they go away? Do they disappear? Like, why can't you? Like, those stars are shining just as brightly as they were before, yet the sun comes out, and it's like they're not even there anymore. You know why? It's because the magnificence, the brightness, the glory of the sun shines even brighter. It's as if to say, like, the stars are one form of glory, but the sun is a whole different level. Now, here's what's incredible. This is what it tells us about when Jesus shows up. Isaiah writes this. He says, see the day of the Lord is coming. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Why? Uh, why when Jesus shows up in his glory, and we see a glimpse of this also in Revelation 6, why when Jesus shows up, why does the sun go dim? Why does the moon disappear? Are they hiding? Is their light taken away? No. When Jesus shows up, his glory will be so much greater than the sun, it will darken it in comparison. That is the glory of Jesus. That is the presence of Jesus. In fact, it tells us in Revelation 6, 6, the glory of Jesus is so bright that people will bow down, cower, and beg for the trees and the rocks to cover their face because of how the, the face of the one who sits upon the throne. What we need in our church and in our lives is to behold Jesus in such awe that every other light in our lives falls dark in comparison. We are a people of Jesus. And what we need is the rule and reign of Jesus. We need the way of Jesus. We need the teaching of Jesus. Would we surrender over to him? May we fall face down to the ground in reverence and say, Jesus, what do you have to say to us? What are you calling us to? May Jesus lead our church. May Jesus lead our marriages. May Jesus lead our lives. May Jesus lead our children so that it would be like what Moses said in Exodus 33. If you you don't go with us, if your presence is not with us, don't send us there. Just like Joshua sitting here saying, What message do you have for your servant before we go into battle? Because what our church needs, what our city needs, what our country needs, what our world needs is men and women on their face before a righteous commander. Our city needs you. Our city needs you so encountered with Christ so moved by his glory, so soaked in his presence that you don't fear anything. You can live in boldness. You can stand on biblical values. You can preach and teach the way of Christ. Why why is Joshua able to face these enemies that are bigger, stronger, without fear? It's because he has a greater fear, 
a greater awe, a greater surrender to the living God. The reason Joshua can boldly charge forward and obey is because he knows who his commander is. He surrendered to the real thing. You guys, we need the real thing in our lives. No, nothing else false. Um, Thursday night, my kids got home from trick-or-treating and uh, they do what kids do. They take their bags and their buckets and they empty them on the kitchen table and they start sorting through, right? And uh, you're always like, no, it's bedtime. You are not eating that whole bucket. But you know they sneak one or two, right? It's just, it's, it's part of their nature. Like they, they, they have to. It's the, it's the sinful fall within them. And so uh, I get up the next morning and uh, our kids don't have school the next day. And so um, I'm, I'm in the kitchen and I'm making coffee. And um, I hear my kids at the table. And what they're discussing is they're pulling out all the candy frauds. You know candy frauds, the things that don't belong. Like, wh- like, why are you, g- they're like, why would you give this to children, you know? Um, things like, they had granola bars. They each had a granola bar. Like, and they're like, wh- who does this? What's happening? <laughs> Oatmeal cookies? Like, kids don't want none of that, right? And, th- and the bane of a child's existence, uh, almond joys. Like, coconut and, all- and nuts? Like, they don't, they, they want none of that. And, and I just hear they start to debate, what, like, what is their, th- what is the thinking? How does this happen? And, and I kid you not, I hear Nova and my daughter, and she just goes, oh, Dax, come here. I think I know. I think it was a teacher who put the granola bar in. <laughs> and he goes, why? And she reads the back, and she says, oh, look, it says classroom safe, allergen free. <laughs> and, and Dax goes, well, that makes sense. Teachers have to be careful these days, you know? <laughs> and then I watch as Dax grabs something, and uh, he walks over into the kitchen, and it's an almond joy. And uh, he doesn't merely throw it away. He opens it first and pulls it out of the wrapper as if he's like, I don't want somebody to accidentally come across this. <laughs> and he stands over that garbage, and he holds it in his hand, and he just like slowly like turns and lets it drop down like a dead rat, just... <laughs> And then he takes his hand and he just like wipes it off. Like, I can't believe I touched such uncleanness, right? (laughs) As if he's sitting there saying, give me the good stuff or nothing else, you know? There's like a purity there. Um, You guys, I'm so tired of churches saying they are Bible-believing, gospel-centered, Jesus-loving, and yet people show up and they get almond joys and granola bars. They preach religion. They preach tribes. They preach political agendas. They preach moralism. You guys, we need to give people the good stuff and nothing else. And guess what? Jesus is the good stuff. He is the only one who will save. He is the only one who will heal. He is the only one who will stand as a lasting beacon of hope. Everything else is temporary. It is the kingdom of God that is eternal and is what we need. Our city needs a place where Jesus is preached week in and week out, amen? That's what we need. Your children, what they need is a relationship with a savior who loves them more than you ever could. What your marriage needs is a Jesus at the center that shows you what love and forgiveness actually looks like. What our church needs is to be a place that preaches, teaches, worships, and boldly declares the name and nature of Jesus week in and week out and nothing else. We are building a house for Jesus. That's what we're doing. That's what we're building. And so as we press forward in this and we come back next week with our gifts and our pledges, bring them for Christ, nothing else. Bring them as an act of worship of your heart, saying, no, I give, I'm giving in a way that declares the glory of Jesus, that I believe the most important thing for my children. I believe the most important thing for my city. I believe the most important thing for my neighbors is an altar in the middle of our city, a platform, a pulpit, that points to the single pillar in which we can build our lives upon. We are building a house for Jesus where his name is declared, where his nature is worshiped, where his word is taught, where his presence is felt, where his healing is experienced, where his glory is revered, where his way is walked in. We are building a house where the light of Jesus shines bright in a dark world. And it says, the commander of the Lord's army replied, 
take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. We need holy ground. That's what we need in our lives. Places that are marked out for encounter. And notice, it's not until Joshua turns his attention to Jesus. It's not until Joshua turns away from his enemies and the distractions and the lesser things. And it's not until Joshua falls on his face, longing for an encounter, that Jesus says, okay, now you and I, we're going to have a moment together. And this is a moment that's going to shape your life. This is a moment that's going to change you. See, holy ground is space and place marked out for encounter with Jesus. Holy ground is, a pl- is the place where broken marriages can reconcile. Holy ground is a place where confession is met with forgiveness and healing. Holy ground is a place where we fall to our knees and say, all hail King Jesus. You are the one who gets my allegiance. You are the one I put my hope in. You are the one I surrender over to. Holy ground is a place where we cry out, for a glimpse of the glory of God. Jesus wants an encounter with you, just like he wanted it with Joshua. He wants to manifest his glory to you, but you have to want it. You have to long for it. You have to desire it. You have to fall to your knees and lift up your hands and surrender to his majesty. You guys, would you pray with me? God, we want to have an encounter with you. We want to build our lives upon you. We long for your presence here today. We long for your healing. We long for your hope, Jesus. Would you meet us here in this space? Would you give us a hunger in our hearts, a desire, a surrender? And let me just say this while I'm praying. There's some of you who are here today and you're like, I need an encounter with Jesus. It's something in your life, something you're feeling anxiety over. Maybe you're just hungry for more of him. If that's you, right where you're at, would you just raise your hand? He sees you, yeah, yeah, keep him up. Yeah, raise your hand, say, I need an encounter with God. I long for an encounter with God. God comes where he's wanted. God, you see these hands. Would you meet these people in this place today? Would you meet him with your comfort, with your healing, with your grace, with your strength, with your courage? And Lord, for all of us, would you just bring us to a place where we're like, we need you. We need more of you. We need your presence. We need holy ground in our lives. God, you are so good and you are so holy and you are so righteous. We pray all of this in your name and all God's people said.